ate meat, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called and house of prayer for all people. The Lord God, which gathers the outcasts of Israel, yet will I gather others to him besides those that are gathered unto him. I got a typo. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain. Now, this is Matthew chapter 21, that it is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer. My house shall be called a house of prayer. Now, let's look. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain, my holy mountain, and I'll make them joyful in my house of prayer. The house of prayer is a joyful place. And what are they doing? They're bringing burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted in mine house. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Now, Spirit asked me a question. The Lord asked me a question. He's, and the question was, when did God stop accepting burnt offerings and sacrifices? When did our Lord God stop accepting, accepting, not offering, but accepting burnt offers, offerings and sacrifices? When did God stop offering Stop accepting burnt offerings and sacrifices. Most people will say when Jesus died on the cross, the sacrificial system was dealt, done away with. It. But he says, that's not true. I'm still accepting burnt offerings and sacrifices. But they are coming through those who are coming to my house to pray. When we fail to pray, then we really have no other way, no better way to offer burnt offerings and sacrifices. We're not bringing lambs, goats, bullocks, but that is how we bring our burnt offering and sacrifices. He says, I'm the Lord God that changes not. So, if we don't bring our offering and our sacrifices to prayer, how else do we bring them? We don't. We say, well, we bring the sacrifice of praise. But our prayers, or how we bring, we're going to see later in Hebrews chapter 5, how we bring offerings to God. We become the offering. You see why the enemy fights us so hard to keep us out of prayer. It seems like a foreign thing. It's easier for us to do other stuff in the house of God. Seems more comfortable. Seems a little weird to come in and just pray. It's like we have to be told what to do. James 5 and 16 says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. Let's start at the beginning. We're never going to confess our faults to one another. Why? Because we, we seldom let the Spirit of God deal with us in prayer enough to tender our heart to the place that we would even consider in the wildest of our imagination confessing a fault to a person. Because pride entering, it's just so easy to say, is their problem. They were the one. But James 5 and 16 is in the Bible. Confess your faults one to another. Husband and wives can sleep in the same bed and won't do that. Best of friends will break up and won't do that. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another. And, and, and that you may be healed. You know, healed, that the situation may be fixed. 
And then he says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Effectual, what does that mean? To pray with force. Now, it's in the Bible. I didn't put it there. It's not a denominational thing. He says the effectual prayer. So what does God, is he requiring when he say pray? Whether we are learned to do it or we feel like doing it or we want to do it, he says the kind of prayer that I'm looking for, God is looking for, is a prayer that's prayed with force, not a thought-out prayer, not a mentally assenting prayer where I'm praying in my heart, but God knows I ain't got to move my lips. The word effectual means to pray with force, to do in such a way as to produce, to encourage a result. It's akin to a lawyer arguing a case. If you got an old lawyer, he's up there and he's just, well, yeah. You want a lawyer that is effectual. You want a Ben Casey. You want to feel some fervency. You're sitting there, and they're about to pull the cord on the electric chair on you. You don't want some lawyer over there, and he's got egg salad on his jacket. You know what I mean. He's yawning. He's, he's nodding. He's nodding in prayer. I mean, nodding, in, you know, why the prosecutors up there laying out the charges you got to hunch him and say hey man did you hear what he said he said i sliced and diced some people and you know you you're like wait a minute here you want to know that he did his research he had his staff up all night wait a minute man they finna put you away for life you want an effective attorney you want car and car you want swartz and brown, you know. Yeah, yeah, you want to do with the three wolves. Yeah, you want some some cracker jack. You want to raise up Johnny. You want somebody that's got some street creds or something. And when he gets up and talk, you want him with confidence. Come on now, let's look at the word here. This is how God said, when we say come boldly, he wants somebody that's coming into the courtroom that is coming knowing I got a right to be here. So I'm just trying to tell us that when we pray, it ain't had nothing to do. Lawyer, I don't care about the fact you and your your wife have issues at home. I'm paying you, you repping me in the courtroom. So what you can't find, your puppy. My court time is 11 o'clock. Let your puppy go. So what? Whatever your personal issues is, I don't care. They're going to send me down the river. they trying to get me for life, whatever. I need you to be sharp. Don't come in there drunk. Hello? In a stupor. You done left your briefcase or something. No, sir. I need you to talk with force. Do it in such a way as to produce a result. I need you objecting. Amen? So when he says pray the effectual fervent prayer, pray, go before God to encourage a result. This stuff works at home, and it works when we come together. Then he says fervent. It means very enthusiastic or passionately. James 5 and 16, the effectual fervent prayer, the persuasive, enthusiastic, passionate. Uh, God's telling you how to pray. It ain't got nothing to do with your church upbringing. It, you ain't feeling it. Your feet tired. You worked all day. You pull a double. He says, well, don't, wor don't worry about praying right now. When you come, this is how, because I don't want to hear my attorney say, oh, I got a caseload. Bro, I ain't, burning, I ain't trying to hear all that. You dealing with Stephen G. Conley's case right there. Don't be, oh, this, you know, you got the wrong case in front of me and all this. And let's see, you're up for, for rape of a little child or something. Whoa, player, that ain't me. Ain't you going to, you going to wait a minute. What, you get the right case. Yes. This is what God is saying, that when you pray, Come to him. If you're getting up in the nighttime, 
Go on and rinse your mouth out. Take a swig of water. And if you can do it, pray fervently. He didn't say how long. Is that right? So I'm just trying to tell you what the court of heaven is doing when it's watching how you pray. Because what the court of heaven is saying, you, whatever it is you're asking for, you really don't want it. Because somehow we have allowed religion to tell us it don't take all that. But the court of heaven, the judge sitting there and the whole jury is sitting there watching and like saying, you know, when they get in that room, they say, I think he's guilty. <laughs> and your, whoever argued your case is the one sending you up the river. So when we pray, we are arguing a case in the court of heaven. We're begging for mercy because we don't deserve what we're asking for. We're saying, please consider this. Because Jesus paid for it, and you don't have to grant this to me. But if we come up there like, well, I, you know, I, I know he paid, but I ain't in no way to get it. But if you see it, if it's your will, and you don't know all of that, he can say, well, you didn't know that, counselor, before you came in here, what the law said? So I know it's your will that I would have this, but avenge me of my adversary. The devil is stopping me from having my peace, having a double portion. You, this, is what, this is why he said pray fervently. Somebody said, well, if God knows this, why don't he give it to you? Because he wants us to come to him and be reminded that we don't deserve anything. It's how he keeps us humble. Because if we go to him like we deserve it, we come to him like the prodigal son. Give me what belongs to me. And God is trying to tell you, nothing belongs to you. It's because of my grace that I give it to you. Maybe I don't want you to have it right now. But in some cases, God will give you what you ask for. But he said, you're going to pray fervently for it. You're going to remember how much you and how you asked me for it. So when you wished you hadn't got it, you're going to remember that. Elijah was a human. This is, uh, uh, this is a modern translation. Elijah was as human as we are. Yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Elijah was as human as we are. The King James says Elijah was a man of passion just like we are. But when he prayed, no rain fell for three and a half years. But 1 Kings 18.42 says, So Ahab went up to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel, bowed low to the ground, and prayed with his face between his knees. Now, when the last time you wanted to get something from God that you, you really got, put your face between, oh, y'all better hear me, face between your knees. Can you get in that kind of position? We barely want to get down on our knees. Let me see if old man can do that. Get down. But now you putting your face between your knees. He was saying, I'm going to close and shut out everything. That's what he's saying. He put his face between his knees and he asked God for what he wants when he asked for that prayer. So what he's trying to tell you is that posture does matter because we've been hoodwinked that it don't matter about the posture. It matters about the posture, and it matters about the intensity. But what happens when we get in a corporate situation is we have bought, the thing is, somebody said one time, well, doesn't the Bible say, be not as the hypocrites who love to pray in the, in the public, but when thou prayest, pray in the secret closet. That's in the scripture, that when you pray in your secret closet, God will reward thee openly. And what they've done is they've made gumbo out of the scripture. They've mixed it all up so that it messes up both their secret prayer and corporate prayer. But 
I want you to look at a couple of things real quickly here, real quickly. Matthew chapter 18 and 19, most of us know by heart that if any two of you on earth shall agree as touching anything, any two of you, that's corporate. So that takes away praying in your secret closet right there. You don't just have to pray in your secret closet. That means if two of you agree on earth as touching anything, the Lord gets in the midst of it. Acts 2 and 42. And, two and Look there quickly if you can. The quicker we can go there, the quicker I'll leave because I'm not going to wait. Amen. Acts 2 and 42. Now, I'll just tell you what the, what the Lord told me to do. He says that my people need to pray, and he told me to get the stuff away from the altar, open the altar up, move the stuff away from the altar. That's what he told me to do. I'm not going to force anybody there, but that's what the Spirit of the Lord told me to do. Amen. So you don't have to come. But you can kneel at your seat. You can sit. You can stand. You don't have to do nothing. But I just did what he told me to, told me to do. Because he said his house is a house of prayer. And he just began to deal with He said you can do everything else. You can sing till the cows come home. You can preach until the lights is out. He said, but you can't pray because you've fallen into what this, the church has fallen into. They can't. They don't want my house to be a house of prayer, but my house is a house of prayer. That's what it's supposed to be. Amen. Acts 2 and 42, and they continue steadfastly in whose doctrine? Not any denomination's doctrine, but the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. That's what they did. That was what the church service was predominantly about, fellowship. And in prayers, they did a whole lot of praying, a whole lot of praying. You know, they were not uncomfortable with praying. Acts 1 and 14, back up. They were not uncomfortable with praying. They didn't try to miss the prayer service. That's why they prayed throughout the service. Amen. Acts 1 and 14, these continued all with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women, Mary the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Supplication meant that they got into crying they got into making noise. They, uh, they were moaning. They were interceding. They weren't sitting. And this is not to bring any bad feeling on anybody, but they had well gotten past the being uncomfortable with sounds coming from each other to the place where they themselves had grown up that they could uh, toss uh, a log on the fire. Amen. The supplication. You can look it up later. Acts 12 and 5. This is, uh, they had grown from just having to have a, a church. And everybody's, you know, had to always have somebody doing something to entertain them. Uh, to them. And they said, let's pray, man. Some going down. The folk could hit the, hit, the, hit the knees and pray. They could do whatever what they needed to do because my house is a house of prayer. Acts chapter 12, verse 5. Peter was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Now, at that time, they didn't, weren't always at home. Well, we'll pray for both brother Peters. Okay, good night. They got together and they prayed. We know this to be true because when Peter got out and knocked on the door, the girl that answered the door, she, you know, they in there praying. She thought it was Peter's spirit. So the folk was praying. They was at the house. They wasn't in, they could have been in there eating some old pie. Ain't, ain't nothing wrong with that. Could have been in there watching some television. Could have been in there talk, telling some jokes, watching some Netflix, playing some oh no. But Peter was in prison. He was about to be killed. James had been killed, so they know it was the real deal. That's the equivalent of maybe me being killed, and then they snatch one of these pastors here. And, you know, good God help us, y'all. Okay, well, let's go to the fair. Jesus, they, they, they didn't kill me now. <laughs> it was, well, no, they didn't kill me. They killed one of them. And, and I'm in prison, and y'all were, well, well What's on uh, the new movie is on tonight? Let's all sit around. Somebody call CC's Pizza. Y'all bunch of hypocrites. That's basically what that would have been. They killed the Apostle Peter. They took it serious enough. 
It wasn't somebody up in COVID and the doctor in the hospital, the doctor wouldn't let you come visit. They killed them. And so the Bible says they they did not cease to pray. And verse 6 and said, when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with chains, and the keeper uh, before the door kept the prisoner. And behold, the angel of the Lord came unto him. So when they prayed, the angel said, oops, time to go. Got to get Peter out of prison. Matter of fact, they had put 16 Roman soldiers around him to keep him uh, chained in. The angel of the Lord came and smote him. We're talking about supernatural things happen when people pray. Can you say amen? Go on down a little bit. Verses uh, 10, he says, when they were past the first and second war, now the angels tell him, come on through. Come on, man. Come on out. Get up. Hurry up, dude. Come on through here. They're coming through the wards. You know, they got gates that lock and this gate. Verse 11, and when Peter was come to himself, now, uh, now of a surety, now I know of a surety that the Lord have sent his angel, have delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. And there were many gathered together praying. So that blows this that I got to just pray in my closet. Many gathered together and praying. We're supposed to be a praying people. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, the damsel came and hearkened. Rhoda was her name. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, are you mad? They was praying, but they was in unbelief a little bit. But she confirmed constantly, or constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then they said, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he beckoned unto them with hand to hold their peace, declaring unto them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, go show these things unto James and to uh, the brethren. And he departed and went unto another place. So it was prayer that brought him out. 2 Corinthians 1 and 11. Quickly, 2 Corinthians 1 and 11. Prayer changes things. And we've got lots of us are in prison. Amen. One way or another, praise God, somewhere. Amen. And we need people praying for us. I do. I'm in prison. I got a, I got a couple of little jail, jail time deals I'm dealing with. Pray for me. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you don't got nobody else, pray for me. Amen. 2 Corinthians 1 and 11. It says, ye also helping together by prayer for us. That's the apostles talking. Amen. Pray for us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thank may be given by many on us behalf. Pray for us. Amen. I want you to pray. So what gift I have can operate. Maybe some people don't want to pray because they're afraid if I use it, may be blessed. I don't know. But that's what the apostles said. Pray for us that the gift that God gave us can operate. Amen. Pray for each other. Praise the Lord. You ain't got nobody else to pray. When you get tired of praying for yourself, pray for Stephen G. Conley. Amen. I'm praying for you. Pray for me. Pray. Don't talk about me. Pray about me. Amen. Amen. Don't hate me. Pray for me. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. I may be in prison, but pray me out. Pray me out. What you think about me may be true, so but just pray me out of it. Amen. Be, be a part of the miracle when you see me come knocking and saying, you know what? I was in prison. Amen. You can say, I knew it. I knew it. God delivered him. Amen. Praise, praise the Lord. That's how it worked. Pray me out. Amen. Joel chapter 1, verse 14. We're supposed to be a praying people. Amen. We ought to be able to pray even if the music ain't right. Amen. Some probably probably said, Lord, he prayed that house of prayer that about drove me crazy. Amen. Well, I hope you got the message. Make me a house of prayer. Amen. Make me a house of prayer. 
Make me a walking prayer house. That way the Lord can tell you at any time, stop and pray. That's why we should pray in the spirit. We should pray in the spirit. Amen. Amen. I'm not boasting when I say it. I just do it because I do. But I pray probably 90% of the time when I'm by myself in the spirit, in, the, in tongues. I do. It's just something I've developed, and I do it. I'm not saying it like that makes me more spiritual. It's just I'm comfortable with doing that, and I'm comfortable with doing it around other people. But the Bible says that we should pray in tongues. Amen. It helps me not to have to think a lot. And I have faith that God knows what I'm praying about, especially when I get up in the nighttime and I feel encouraged to pray. I don't know what he wants me to pray about, but if I pray to all y'all every night, I never get back to sleep. So I just pray in the spirit. Amen. Praise God. And somewhere or another, whatever it is, God needs someone to pray through. When I say he needs someone, it's because he designed it that way. Amen. That's why he made you his, his, his witness. Amen. Uh, look at uh, Joel 1 and 14. It says, sanctify ye a fast. Call a solemn assembly. That's what prayer time is. It's a solemn assembly. No, it's not joy bells ringing in my soul time. It's a solemn assembly. It really is a time when we are quieter or not as laughy and chatty. But it's necessary. Gather the elders. Amen. That, that means the old people, but the elders, whatever we want to call that tonight. And all the inhabitants of the land into the house. Big shots, little shots, important people, unimportant people, whatever. And, and look what it says. In the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. Did you hear what it said? It said, cry unto the Lord. It says, I tell God, amen. The devil said, man, they waiting on you. I said, I ain't here to entertain. I'm going to move when he say move. Because we're so, we are so, people come expecting to be entertained. And if we're not careful, we, can, we will be the entertainer. But it says, bring them in here to cry. The Lord will win a lot of people when the church learns how to cry. And it's not a shame to cry. Crying convicts a lot of people. Sinners can't handle it when the church is crying. But if the church won't cry, sinners can't see any reason to cry. Sinners are laughing because.